Hello, this is Michael Paul with New Orleans Scottish Rite College. Recently, I was contacted by a young Mason with a question about the early history of speculative Freemasonry. He said that he had originally believed that modern speculative Masonry evolved out of the old operative Freemasons, but then he read something that discounted that idea. He wanted to know my thoughts on the matter. Okay, let's talk about it. To start with, Early speculative Masonic history is a mess. That's simply the way it is. We have so many missing or non-existent records, and so very much that is left to the best guess of whoever is writing the history. In addition, the history of operative Freemasonry is even more lacking. Yes, we do know some things, but so very much is anyone's guess. When you take these situations and couple it with the very valid demand of you say it or write it, you prove it, then it makes for a problematic situation. Any quick answer can bring discredit on the one saying it. To understand this situation, we need to understand what operative masonry means, what speculative Freemasonry means, and what evolving from means. Or at least we should agree on some common understandings. First, what was a lodge of operative Freemasons? Well, it can be looked at as a union of sorts. Skilled workers in the building trade, or guilds, could find employment through membership in such lodges. Someone would want something built, and they would contract an operative lodge to build it. The lodge would provide all of the workers needed. All of the workers would be required to be able to travel to wherever the work site was located. This is what's understood as Freemason. One who was a member of an operative lodge could not be a bondsman, a slave, or an indentured servant. They needed to be able to travel to wherever the job would take them. Another thing about an operative lodge of Freemasons is that they did not just have stonemasons as members. The buildings that were built by these lodges also needed carpenters, as well as workers in metal, glass, or anything else that was needed. It was a workers' union of those who were needed in the construction of any building. We can also find evidence that such lodges were also training schools, where young men who desired to one day join the lodge as full members and workers on building projects could learn as apprentices. So an operative lodge would be a place to learn and obtain work in the building trade. Now we can look at most any Masonic history book and we'll find that an English minor aristocrat and alchemist by the name of Elias Ashmole wrote in his diary that he joined Warrington Lodge on October 16, 1646. Okay, what was Warrington Lodge? What does his joining this lodge mean? And is this diary entry true? Well, Warrington Lodge would seem to have been an operative lodge of Freemasons. The suggestion here is that this is the first evidence of a speculative Freemason. It seems that Ashmole joined an operative lodge but had no interest in becoming an operative Freemason. He had other reasons for becoming a member. As to if it is true, well, I've not seen any lodge record of him. Maybe there is one, but all I have seen is reported entries from his diary. The best that I can do is look at this situation from a logic standpoint. I can examine what I know and don't know and give an opinion based on what I believe is probable. If Warrington Lodge was a lodge of operative Freemasons, then they would have been a place of employment for workers in the building trade. Why would they have any interest in someone joining them who was not a skilled craftsman? Well, let's step back for a moment and look at what was going on around that time. If what we know about the history of the great European cathedrals is accurate, then the biggest and greatest ones were built between the general time of 1000 and 1500 A.D. By the time that Ashmole is reported to have joined, the building trade seems to have gone into a decline. Operative lodges may have had trouble in finding work for their craftsmen. But again, why would a lodge of operative Freemasons have any interest in someone who was not a skilled craftsman joining them? How could his joining an operative lodge be of any benefit to anyone? For that matter, what would it be about a trade guild that would be of any interest to someone like Ashmole. I believe that we need to step outside the known information and common reports to take another look at the situation from both sides. 
We also need to realize that we can't look at past events using our common knowledge of events today. The truth is that the common lodge experience in the U.S. today is dramatically different than the common U.S. lodge experience from the early to mid-1800s or even 1900s. We have to realize that we are wholly unfamiliar with the lodge experience of an operative lodge in England in the 1600s or earlier. If we were somehow transported back in time to the initiation of Elias Ashmole, it is certain that we would seem to be in a very different world. But even with the clear understanding that the lodge experience of Ashmole at the time of his initiation was very different from the lodge experience of Masons today, it does not answer the why of the question. Why would either the lodge or Ashmole have any interest in this initiation taking place? Let's look at the lodge first. If this was a lodge of operative Freemasons, and it had been experiencing a good number of years of declining work, then it would likely be in some financial trouble. The lodge would need income to pay the bills as well as the workers. If someone like Ashmo was willing to pay to be accepted into the operative lodge, then why not take his money? Clearly, if any work came, he would not be sent out with the other workers. He was not an actual Freemason. He was an accepted Mason. When we look at the situation in this light, it would seem reasonable for such lodges to create a special category for individuals who are of good character and willing to pay the lodge for something akin to honorary memberships. This would make sense for the lodge, but it still does not explain why individuals like Ashmole would have any interest in such a lodge. From what we know about Elias Ashmole, he was a very accomplished individual. He showed interest in basically all of the seven liberal arts and sciences. He was an alchemist, an astrologer, a solicitor, which is an early English attorney, a founding fellow of the Royal Society of London, and a collector of many rare manuscripts. This was a most interesting and talented man of metaphysical, spiritual, and scientific thought. So why would he even entertain the idea of joining such a guild? Well, maybe because this was not just some collection of hard-working laborers. The Freemasons had always possessed a unique reputation in all of the areas where they visited and worked. Most people spent their lives in the small communities where they lived. They would work until nightfall and then come home. This was their life, and it was repeated each day until they died. It was a big deal when travelers from out of their area came to town. In the evening, stories from areas they had never seen, and would likely never see, were shared. By the mere fact of their traveling from area to area, the Freemasons grew in knowledge. They became educated in many subjects by exposure to them in their travels. They developed a mystique. By the 1500s, the Dark Ages were ending, and what would follow was the Reformation, and then the Age of Enlightenment. Individuals like Ashmole were some of the early leading figures in this new desire to learn, to explore, and grow as humans. With all of the subjects that interested Ashmole, certainly the mystique of the Freemasons and their secrets must have called to an intellectual seeker like him. He was hungry for knowledge and wanted to learn firsthand the secrets of the Freemasons. He reached an agreement with them and was accepted by a lodge. Interestingly enough, after he joined, his diary shows him as participating in a lodge only rarely. There may be good reasons for his lack of participation. We have to remember that an operative lodge of Freemasons was primarily a workers union. They existed first and foremost to find work for their members. Ashmo could very likely have found the business meetings of the lodges very boring, but that's only a guess based on what the man is reported to have been interested in and the fact that after joining, he rarely attended. If the lodge had been active in the areas where he had held great interest, it would seem that he would have attended far more often. Again, these lodges, regardless of any reputation that they held, were primarily a workers' union designed to train and then find building jobs for their workers. These workers wanted to put food on their tables and went to lodges to find jobs. 
they had a very different reason for going than Ashmole. Over the next 100 to 150 years, the building trade declined even further. We also find traces of speculative lodges of Freemasons during this period. These would be made up solely of those who did not consider themselves as operative Freemasons or actual construction workers. When we step back, it seems to be a most interesting time. Operative Masons went to lodge to find work so that they could put food on the table. The speculatives went to lodge to discuss more esoteric subjects alluded to by the operatives and maybe expand on them. For one, Lodge was a practical experience designed to find work. For the other, it was an educational experience designed for personal enlightenment. With such different goals, it seems odd that they would have been mixing at all. In 1717, the Grand Lodge of England was created, organizing lodges of speculative Freemasons. Speculative Freemasonry took off and spread around the world like dry houses on fire. To say that it became popular everywhere it was organized is an understatement. Operative lodges certainly did not benefit from the wildfire worldwide growth of speculative Freemasonry. It was apples and oranges. What was offered in the speculative lodges is what was widely sought by the common man, education and enlightenment. But as time passed and interest continued to grow, members wanted to know the history of speculative Freemasonry. Unfortunately, here is where problems began. Claims of Freemasonry going back to the days of King Solomon were not uncommon. Glorified royal history seemed to be desired. These sorts of wild claims have damaged serious Masonic research and caused some to doubt the ability of Masonic organizations to conduct objective research into its own history. Too much of what was presented as history was fantasy. So let's try to bring all of this together and look at it. The old operatives made their living by working in the building trade. Speculative masons made their living from any and all jobs under the sun. The old operatives met in lodges to train, learn about, and find jobs in the building trade. Speculative masons met in lodges to discuss theories, ideas, and lessons designed to improve themselves. Yes, we can find records of some who joined operative lodges who did not seek to be involved in the building trade. Yes, operative Freemasonry was on the decline when speculative Freemasonry was on the rise. Yes, speculative Freemasonry was created on the perceived model of operative Freemasonry. The working tools, symbols, stations, and ranks were tweaked, used, and assigned various moral lessons. It's simply not possible to look at speculative Freemasonry without looking at what we know of operative Freemasonry. The two are intertwined by centuries of real, imagined, or borrowed association. Speculative Freemasonry is at the very least heavily inspired by the old operatives. That seems clear, but to say that operative Freemasonry transformed itself into speculative Freemasonry is something that I personally don't believe can be proven. It seems likely that individuals who were inspired by the lore of the old operatives created something based on them and gave it touches that they believed were suited for what they needed. I believe it is very possible that some who may have joined operative lodges with no intention of working in the building trade felt that this gave them certain rights to create their own Masonic lodges even if they were a bit different than the ones that they joined. Anyway, that's my take on the matter. I don't see that we can prove much more than what is already out there without brand new information being discovered, which is always possible. Of course, in the end, I don't think it is something that really matters. The lessons of speculative Freemasonry are valid and have stood the test of time. Speculative Freemasonry does not have to be thousands of years old to be valid. If masonry is at all declining today, it is not because of the lessons taught by our lodges. It would seem that the problems may be coming from the lack of those lessons being taught. Thank you for watching. I hope this video has been of some value. If you like the channel, please hit the like button and subscribe to us. See you next time.